In this video, we combine some of the most terrifying cave diving disasters we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt, to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. In 2011, Agnes Malauka went for an exploration of the Tank Cave. Tank Cave stands out among the best out of all the caves around Mount Gambier. Agnes was exploring the mysteries of the cave till she met her untimely demise. Tank Cave got its name from a water tank that sits directly on top of the entrance. It's located in Mount Gambier, South Australia. To enter the cave, you have to climb down a short ladder because the entrance is underground. The Cave Divers Association of Australia strictly controls access to this entrance. Tank Cave is a rare gem, and diving through it gives divers joy. The cave, which has a small surface, leads to an extensive maze-like system with over 23,000 feet 7, meters of passage that cavers can dive through. It also has numerous side channels. The cave is relatively shallow. Its maximum depth is around 65 feet, 20 meters. Its water is crystal clear. You can dive through the water with utmost clarity and little or no hindrance. Tank Cave is one of the longest underwater caves in Australia, and a fixed line runs throughout most of the cave. However, one prominent feature made the cave dangerous. The system of the cave is quite complicated. It looks like a wild spider web. To guard against mishaps, cave divers must go through a step-by-step -step guide to familiarize themselves with the cave before they are given access. All diving protocols must be properly adhered to for a successful dive in Tank Cave. It's amazing to know that many things have been discovered in Tank Cave, yet there is still endless exploration to be done. It's just like the old saying, the more you look into this cave, the less you see. As you go deeper into this cave, you will begin to discover that there is more to know about it. Divers who are up for an interesting yet dangerous adventure always visit the cave. This is because the cave had tight restrictions and it could get hard to see while inside due to the limited body space available. Some parts of the cave are so enclosed that some explorers may be required to pull their tanks before they can pass through without hindrance. The enclosed nature of the cave is not so great because the insides of the cave roof and wall are so soft and squishy. Therefore, big roof parts fall on divers as they breathe air. This disrupts the clarity of the water, resulting in an inability to see clearly. Agnes Mylauka was a woman of passion and an international cave explorer. She was born on December 23, 1981, in Australia. Agnes was a highly qualified diver with certifications such as Potty Open Water, Advanced Open Water and Rescue, CDAA Advanced Cave, TDI Advanced Trimix, and much more. She never wanted to be a technical diver, but she said everything happened spontaneously. Her passion took her into the deepest waters and caves and she experienced the best of her feelings and she became a technical diver. Furthermore, she was an underwater photographer, author, maritime archaeologist, and cave explorer. Agnes was part of many international diving projects and documentaries. It wasn't a surprise that Agnes gained international recognition as a diver because she always launched into deeper cave systems across Australia and Florida. She went far beyond the places other divers had previously gone, and she was always successful at it. She was also a public speaker and author in her profession of diving and maritime archaeology. Agnes's life journey revealed that she was dedicated to her passion. During the summer of 2007, Agnes completed an internship program at St. Augustine, Florida with the Lighthouse Archaeological Maritime Program, LAMP, which was the research house of St. Augustine Lighthouse and Museum. Agnes participated in the archaeological excavation of historic shipwreck sites. 
This work introduced her to Florida diving, where she explored extensive cave systems. Cave exploration became more of an obsession for Agnes because she was constantly captivated by the sight of unknown passages and where they led to. She was known for exploring, mapping new cave systems, pushing boundaries, and most importantly, returning home with images from her adventures. She displayed these images to the world so they could have a look at what their own eyes couldn't have seen. The Gliders University graduate Agnes Miloka was drawn into the world of cave diving after seeing a hole at the bottom of Piccaninny Ponds near Mount Gambier in 2004. Agnes and James Arendale explored the Elk River Streamway cave system. It has 4,600 feet 1400 meters of passages. This cave has the potential to become the longest continuous stream passage in Victoria, Australia. Agnes had the record for the longest cave dive in Australia for a female after she reached the midpoint of Craig Challen's 2008 line on an expedition near Cucklebitty in 2009. She worked with some TV channels, such as Discovery Channel Japan and the National Geographic Nova TV Expedition in 2008. And in 2009, she was part of the expedition that looked for sinkholes in Queensland, Australia. Agnes also worked on the National Geographic magazine expedition to the Bahamas Caves as a photographic assistant. She laid more than 13,000 feet, 4,000 meters of line across several cave systems, the most significant of which was Baptizing Spring, aka Mission. She and James Toland added more than 9,800 feet, 3,000 meters, to make the connection between Peacock Springs and Baptizing Spring. Because of her passion, she started a TV series called Agnes Mylauka Project, where she featured underwater cave footage shot by Wedge Smiles and Karst Productions. She worked as a cave dive instructor to the actors during the production of James Cameron's film. She won the award of Dive Right Ambassador in 2011. And lastly, she worked for the Trimapi fashion label in their short film titled Birth as a Diving Supervisor. The movie was dedicated in her name to honor her demise. Before the tank cave incident, Agnes had an interview with the Polish radio station. When she was asked if the death of a fellow diver scared her a little, she replied, I am not scared of diving. Anyone at any point can pass away. So you have to live your life as if tomorrow could be your last day. I love diving. I am passionate about it and I don't think anything will stop me from doing it. Unfortunately, there are risks. In every extreme sport, there are dangers. It doesn't always work out, but you do everything possible to not only do that one dive, but to keep on diving over many years. That's what it's all about after all, longevity. You have to dive safely, but live as if every day is going to be your last. This shows the heart of a woman that even the fear of death couldn't stop her from her passion, and she lived true to it till her last breath in diving. After getting to hear about the unfortunate incident, many would conclude that it was Agnes's first time in the tank cave. However, it wasn't. She had explored the tank cave several times in the past, and she also wrote about the cave system, calling it the crowning jewel of all the caves in the region. However, she stated that the cave system was so complicated that it could be likened to a spider web gone wild. This, in essence, was to warn intending cave divers to be extremely careful while navigating the Tank Cave. During her expedition to Tank Cave, which she tweeted about on Friday, February 25, 2011, Agnes was exploring the extensive labyrinth of caves. Agnes ran out of air and suffocated after she became disoriented. Her body was found about 1,800 feet, 550 meters away from the entrance, submerged under 66 feet, 20 meters of water in a tight section of cave, but she was not trapped before her death. Agnes died as a result of the silt she stirred up from the cave walls and floor after she got separated from her diving partner. It was as if she remained calm until her last breath while she was trying to extricate herself. She couldn't see anything and was unable to get out of the cave before she ran out of air. 
Her death could also have been a result of her aggression in the winding and narrow tunnels after diving into a very narrow, rocky passage, which took divers about an hour to reach. She was left alone because the place she dove into couldn't occupy two divers at a time. Consequently, it's not against the rules to dive by yourself under these certain conditions. The victim was reported missing at about 1.45 p.m. on Sunday, February 27th. Her fellow divers worked very hard before they could recover her body. A video of the path she took was recorded, which gave the retriever team the hope of finding her body without drilling through the earth above, as some suggested. The divers paired themselves using a guideline from the entrance of the cave. They positioned emergency tanks along the path they found to their deceased friend. Several hours after the missing report, her body was recovered about 1,970 feet, 600 meters into the cave system by the retriever team, which included her diving buddy, Dr. Harris. Rubidoux Spring Cave is a second magnitude freshwater spring and is located in Waynesville in the region of Ozark Plateau, Missouri in the United States. The spring releases water from the base of a rock ledge, which is capped with a big concrete wall that holds the road that runs over the spring. The water from the spring flows into the Rubidoux Spring in just a short distance. The spring was named after Joseph Rubidoux, a French-Canadian fur trader in the 18th century. Rubidoux Spring is about 57.4 miles in length. It's a landmark that is nestled in the southern part of downtown Waynesville. There's a city park at the site, which has many trails and a boardwalk. It gives a wonderful experience if you go for an adventure there. In Waynesville town, there are several caves, springs, and big sinkholes with short intervals because this particular region has an intense karst landscape. A karst landscape is a landscape with dissolvable bedrock that results in caves, sinkholes, springs, and sinking streams. Karst refers to the soluble rocks such as limestone, marble, and gypsum. That's what these regions are made up of. Rubidoux Spring Cave exploration had begun many years before 1977, and there had been several visits to the Rubidoux Spring Cave's overhead section. But in 1977, Carlson, Delaney, Rimbach, and Tatalovich went on several diving adventures to create more access within the cave. They and several other passionate divers did their best to expand access to the cave. Part of their discovery was Witchaway Avenue and the Big Room. The Witchaway Avenue is a lower tunnel that is about 1,600 feet to the big room and beyond. It's also about 150 feet deep and about four and a half feet high. The big room has now become a place every diver wishes to visit. The big room is about 40 feet in height and 80 feet in width. It has a constant depth of about 160 feet. It has polished, arduous silt that has just a few breakdowns unlike the floor of Witchway Avenue that's filled with pores. On August the 23rd, 2003, three divers decided to explore the big room at a depth of 165 feet and as far as 1,400 feet away from the cave's entrance. The divers were Stephen Wybrock, Ron Shirley, and John Davis. These three divers all had their certifications and were permitted to explore the cave. They all had the right equipment used for exploration. They would use a nitrox tank containing a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen when entering the cave and stage on the line for decompression time. Besides these tanks, they were carrying double travel tanks which contain trimix. This breathing gas consists of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium to reduce the narcosis effects when diving in deep waters. Well equipped, the three divers set out to accomplish their diving purpose, an exploration of the big room. They also took along scooters for propulsion. They had to put on dry suits because the temperature of the water is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. What was their diving plan? It's important for every diver to have a plan before embarking on a diving adventure. It's a major process that ensures divers experience a safe dive and can achieve their goals. This is what will clarify your purpose of diving, the direction you want to go, the necessary equipment needed to accomplish that purpose, and above all, the technique you're going to use to fulfill your purpose of diving. 
So these three diving buddies have their plan techniques well spelled out. They plan to use their nitrox tank while entering the cave from the entrance to the drop-off. The drop-off is a room that is 350 feet away from the entrance. The passageways from this room descend from a depth of 50 feet to 135 feet. Then they would enter a lower tunnel passage. From there, they would switch to trimix cylinders and leave the nitrox tank staged on the line for use during decompression. They would go along the lower tunnel to the big room, which is about 1,100 feet away, using their scooters. While returning to the surface, their decompression stop is at the drop-off and the pool of the spring, where they would pick up the nitrox tank they left earlier for decompression. They also plan to return when they reached the big room or whatever point they reached where one of them was running out of gas in his travel stage bottle. It was wonderful and carefully highlighted the plans they had prepared. The divers were ready for their dive. They'd gotten every detail needed, so they began the dive. When they got to 20 feet, they left behind an oxygen tank for the last stage of decompression. As they continued their dives, they found the permanent guideline. This line was found just 75 feet away from the entrance. With the guidelines in hand, they went further into the cave. They used their scooters to follow the line into the overhead tunnel. They dove through this tunnel, which was as long as 350 feet and as deep as 45 feet, till they got to the drop-off. At 70 feet, they left a tank each for decompression when returning to the surface just as planned. They continued diving into the big room. They needed to pass through Witchaway Avenue. The dive is going quite well for the three divers. Without any ado, they continued their dive into the big room. While still on the journey, Stephen's travel stage bottle got exhausted sooner than expected. To continue with the journey with his friends, he switched to his back tanks without the knowledge of his friends. This switch was too early, of course. They still had a long way to go. They eventually reached their goal, the big room. After that, they began to return through Witchaway Avenue. The pressure in Stephen's back tank had dropped to 500 PSI. At this point, he could not keep it to himself. He informed Ron about it. Ron helped him with his extra regulator. The regulator was attached to a long hose. They both continued towards the drop-off. Their progress became hindered because Stephen could no longer control his buoyancy effectively. John, the third diver, was not carried along with these difficulties they were both experiencing, so he went ahead of them. Stephen was able to get through the tunnel of about 100 feet when the challenge aggravated. He went too far ahead of Ron until the long hose connecting his share regulator was removed from his mouth. He quickly went back to Ron to use his support regulator, took some breaths, and signaled OK to Ron. Ron searched and found the long hose that got disconnected from Stephen and picked it up. At this point, Ron realized he couldn't see Stephen again because of poor visibility caused by the silt kicked up during those activities. Ron continued to the 70-foot decompression stop where their bottles were staged while entering the cave. He found Stephen's bottle still there. But John had taken his bottle and left before he came. Though he couldn't find Stephen, Ron took his bottle and proceeded toward the entrance. Ron saw another group of divers going through the room and assumed Stephen would have been to them for help. Ron got to the surface but couldn't find Stephen, so he reported him missing and sought help to go in search of him. Soon after these search team divers entered the cave, they found the body of Stephen on the roof of the area where he separated from Ron. His body was found floating on this roof. His double tanks were found empty. His exhaust valve that was on his dry suit was closed. What a tragic turn of events. One of the major mistakes Stephen made was not informing his diving buddies about the emptiness of his travel tank when they were going to the big room. This was against their dive plan. Also, it was discovered that his regulator was in a very sensitive setting, which could have caused the regulator to operate in a condition of free flow. Stephen was also using a scooter for the first time in his diving career. It might have been that when the gas was escaping, the noise from the scooter didn't allow Stephen to sense the escape of his gas when they were journeying into the cave. Also, the three divers didn't keep good communication due to poor visibility and their separation from one another. All these, together with the inability to effectively control his buoyancy, 
and poor gas management in the first instance made the dive end up being a tragedy rather than an accomplishment of their intended goal. In 2011, Arthur Kozlowski went on a cave diving exploration into the Polonora Cave together with three friends. He had visited this cave more than 16 times. The purpose of Arthur's exploration was to discover if he could connect this with the caves of Buren, making it the biggest underground cave network in Europe. He got lost exploring new cave tunnels and never returned. Polonora Cave, which has been graced by the presence of many cave divers and was greatly explored by a diver named Artur Kozlowski, is located in Kiltartan, County Galway, Ireland. The cave is under a large beech tree, which is on John Nolan's farmland. There are many imprints on the steps of Polonora Cave because, in times past, the community filled their pitchers and buckets from the well at this cave. The well never ran out of water, even in seasons when everywhere was dry and there was little or no rain at all. This is because it has a limestone landscape, turlows, and underground streams, which are more susceptible to flooding than drought. 196 feet, 60 meters north of Nolan's farmland, is the entrance of Polonora Cave. The shaft at the entrance of the cave drops thick layers of fine clay that cover the bottom of the cave. Disturbing this portion of the cave by divers causes a complete loss of visibility in this zone, which takes a very long time to settle. The roof is composed of boulder clay and loose rocks. As many shafts have been discovered and explored from their length and depth, there are many others yet to be discovered in this cave. Artur Konrad Koslowski was born on October 17, 1977 and was a gifted and dedicated cave explorer. Artur, in his lifetime, achieved great success in the exploration of new caves and the connection of different caves together. Breaking the limitations on cave diving depth in Great Britain and Ireland, he reached a depth of 338 feet, 103 meters. In 2006, Artur Kozlowski left Poznan, Poland for Ireland, where he spent his last years before his death in 2011. He was a quantity surveyor in Poland, and he continued his profession in his new environment, where he worked on several projects, most especially the Aviva Stadium and Houston Square developments in Dublin. He also compiled maps for Galway County Council and the National Roads Authority for the M18 motorway, where he worked on its design and development. Artur was a qualified diver, having made 13 warm water dives before he got to Ireland. His interest in underwater diving spiked in Ireland. Despite being an open water diver, he knew that cave diving is not the same as floating gracefully down the water. In caves lie many awful tight corners, many of which are dark and challenging. You have little information about what lies around the next bend. You must figure things out for yourself inside the cave. When you are treading unexplored paths, you can consider yourself on the journey to great discoveries and, of course, expect to get involved in some dangerous maneuvers. That is why it requires a well-trained diver to venture into a cave. Because of this, in 2007, Artur went for cave diving training with Welsh cave diving instructor Martin Farr, one of the best instructors in Ireland. He used Hell Complex which is part of the Green Holes group of underwater sea caves off Doolan, County Clare, as his training ground when he first began cave diving. Shortly after his training, he started exploring and mapping undiscovered passages, and the first significant breakthrough in cave diving was the first traverse he made between Hell's Kitchen and Robertson's Cave near Reef Complex. Most of the extensions of cave systems in both Ireland and Spain were the work of Artur Kozlowski. The most notable aspect of his work was the extension of the Marble Arch cave system in County Fermanagh. Artur made diving connections to Prod's Pot Cascades Rising. He doubled the length of the cave system from 2.7 miles kilometers, to 6 miles kilometers. These connections were later connected to the newly established Monastir Sink Upper Cradle System which made it wider to the length of 7.1 miles, 11.5 kilometers. This is the longest cave in Northern Ireland. 
He was not just setting records for the longest cave. He also set another record for the deepest cave in Great Britain and Ireland, whose location is in Paula Mary, which is near Killavalley, County Mayo, Ireland, in 2008. The cave system is 338 feet, 103 meters deep. Among his notable achievements in cave exploration is the underwater passage in the notoriously unforgiving cave passages of the Fort region, which is 6.2 miles, 10 kilometers. Another was the discovery and exploration of Palindra, which is the third deepest sump in Great Britain and Ireland, which is 0.6 miles, 1 kilometer in length, and 269 feet, 82 meters in depth. Our tour received an award for cave exploration at the annual Polish Travel and Outdoor Sports held in Gdynia in March 2011. Because of his passion for exploration and diving, his blog is filled with the details of his underwater adventures. Many of his discoveries are published in the journal Irish Speleology, and they are also in Descent magazine. He was an excellent speaker and writer who commanded the respect of everyone in the diving community in Ireland. On his usual adventure of cave exploration, Artur left his home for Kiltartan, County Galway, Ireland, on Saturday, September 3, 2011, to explore Pulanora Cave. He went in the company of two of his friends. They lodged at Tom Nolan's house, as he usually does. Artur had already become like a member of the family because of his regular visits to Kiltartan to explore Polonora Cave. He had visited this cave more than 16 times. The purpose of Artur's exploration was to discover if he could connect this with the Caves of Bern. In that case, it would be the biggest underground cave network in Europe. He began diving on the surface of the cave on Sunday, September 4th, but went underground on Monday, intending to return after three hours. When his friends found out that he didn't return after the time he told them he would return, they thought he might have gone far into the cave, entering new systems. They started searching for him when they became afraid of his extended dive. Connor McGrath of the Irish Cave Rescue Organization stated that they hoped to find more airspaces after finding a sizable airspace halfway down the underground cave. The airspace is near the surface, so that gives us hope that the cave may have more similar airspaces and that he is in one of them, Mr. McGrath said before the discovery of our tour's body. The hope of finding him alive was lost after they searched for him vigorously for a few days to no avail. After facing several struggles to find Artur's body, the rescue team sought out the assistance of the UK Dive Rescue Unit. The British rescue team was led by Coventry firefighters Rick Stanton and John Volanthan. The rescue operation was very risky and challenging due to siltation in the cave system, which means very poor visibility. Conflicting reports came as to the recovery of his body. While the neighborhood became perplexed about finding him alive, the cave diver experts let them know that he might not have been able to survive it. They stated that he might have gone too far into the deepest part of the cave. Besides, although they may find his body, they may not be able to bring it back to the surface. The rescue team kept searching different passages and air pockets of the cave. His body was found late in the evening on Friday, September 9th four days after Artur entered the cave. Artur's body was found at the then known limits of the cave, at a depth of 171 feet, 52 meters, and 2,660 feet, 810 meters, from the entrance. His body was taken halfway through the cave system. As conditions improved the next day, the recovery of his body through the last 1,300 feet, 400 meters, was completed. His body was later taken for a post-mortem at University Hospital, Galway. Our tour's legacy will forever be missed by the Speleology Union of Ireland and other diving communities where he had worked. Even the Kiltartan community also felt the impact of his death because he had been noticed for his frequent visits to the cave. Our tour had visited the Polonora Cave for exploration more than 16 times before his death on the 5th of September, 2011. Our tour was known to always push Irish cave diving to its furthest limits. As he said when he was being interviewed by a radio station, the idea is that I go 
where others turn back. This is just the truth of his life. Due to his dedication and fearlessness, he was the one who discovered many of the systems of caves in both Ireland and Great Britain. He also made most of the cave extensions, making them longer than usual and connecting caves. The last adventure that led to his death was for this purpose too. In honor of his death, a documentary of his life was filmed titled Riders on the Storm. The film was shown at Trinity College Dublin and University College Galway. There has been a mystery concerning Artur's death because the cause seems unknown. The autopsy report revealed that it wasn't a lack of air because he left for the underground cave with air that could last him for more than six hours and he only planned to spend three hours. And when his body was recovered, all his equipment was intact and attached to his body. So what could have taken the life of an experienced diver? No one can tell. Though the sport of cave diving requires extreme mental and physical fitness, Artur was found devoted to it passionately till death. This is an attribute of all successful men. Death is not able to scare them out of their passions. He went as far as surpassing the limits of the man that trained him, Martin Farr, the Welsh cave diving instructor. His discoveries of new caves are his long-standing legacy in the cave diving community. A man who lived his life to impact his community and add value to the world sure deserves some honor. Therefore, in August 2012, Irish Speleology, the Speleological Union of Ireland, set up the Kozlowski Fund in support of the exploration of the original cave in Ireland. This was done in recognition of Artur Kozlowski's contribution to cave diving. A gravestone and plaque were also unveiled to his friends and families that gathered at the third anniversary of Artur's death on September 6, 2014. The plaque was erected at the entrance of Polonora and the gravestone was set up on his grave in Kiltartan. On April 6, 1994, Shek Exley, a cave diver and explorer, went into the Zacaton sinkhole in Mexico for a dive into the unknown at extreme depths. Shek Exley, an American citizen, was born on April 1, 1949. He was just 16 years old when he decided to give diving a try in 1965. After making his first cave diving adventure in 1965, he gave cave diving his sole attention throughout his lifetime. Shek's passion for cave diving drove him to find a paying job that would help him finance his diving career. Just eight years after he started his diving career, during springtime in 1973, Shek joined the eight-day mission to the Hydrolab underwater habitat in the Bahamas, where he worked as an aquanaut. Shek continued with his passion for diving and exploration of caves until he became prominent in this field. You can't open the books of cave diving pioneers without seeing the name of Shek boldly written. He was that excellent. He was an exceptional diver with a heart of gold. Part of his commitment to diving was shown when he started publishing books on the subject of cave diving. He authored these two outstanding books for the community of divers. The first is titled Basic Cave Diving, A Blueprint for Survival, and the second book is Caverns Measureless to Man. Czech was an excellent diver who deserved every bit of honor he received from the diving community. Czech became one of the chairmen of the American Speleological Society, the cave diving section to be precise. As Sheck continued in his diving career with the utmost care, he began to see the need for some rules and procedures to be put in place for safety purposes during dives, so he decided to push some of them to the table. And luckily, most of the rules and procedures for safe diving in use to date were postulated by Sheck during his career days. One of those procedures Sheck made possible was the octopus, which is a diving regulator that is used during the second stage as a backup in case there is any failure when a diver is going through the primary second stage. It's also used as an alternative to enable diving buddies to access one another's gas simultaneously when one of them runs out of gas while diving in the deep. The octopus has now become one of the major pieces of equipment among all the scuba diving equipment, both for cave and open water diving. In history, Sheck was the first technical scuba diver to dive below 800 feet. 
He also planned his dives carefully. The multi-stage decompression used for these dives in open water most of the time takes about 13 hours and 30 minutes. Despite all this, Sheck never experienced any classic cases of decompression sickness in his diving adventures. Besides, Sheck had great narcosis resistance. He wasn't easily affected by it. It's an unusual thing, though. Very few divers have been able to survive the depth of 400 feet in an open water dive. Sheck was one of those few. On the 6th of April 1994, Sheck Exley went into the Zacaton sinkhole in Mexico. At that time, Sheck had acquired 29 years of cave diving experience and had made more than 4,000 dives. Sheck left for an adventure called El Protector de Buceo Profundo project at the Zacaton sinkhole, together with a diving buddy, Jim Bowden. This sinkhole has a depth of about 1,112 feet, which ranks it as one of the deepest sinkholes in Mexico. The depth of this sinkhole was measured with the aid of an autonomous robot. Sheck and Jim set out into the sinkhole independently, but they were using the same techniques. They decided to use independent dive descent lines to prevent being in contact with potential interference during the very fast descent. Each of their dives would be conducted separately, but the maximum depth of this dive was unknown. So they started a new dive line and swam along a 600-foot passageway to the sinkhole. As they completed their equipment check, they agreed that they were finally ready, and they signaled this was a nod to themselves. At this point, they got separated to follow their respective descent lines through the water body. Jim dove for a few seconds before Sheck joined him. They were about 25 to 30 feet separated from each other, but they were connected with the guidelines, visually keeping track of these guidelines. They had to be careful in their descent because any mistake while diving down could lead to a catastrophic incident. After they had descended for a while, Jim looked over to Sheck, who in turn nodded in affirmation. This prompted Jim to submerge and he paused for a minute at about 10 feet before going for a free fall. While diving, Jim and Sheck needed to follow a careful breathing pattern. They took conscious, slow, deep breaths so they could optimize the trade-off between excess gas consumption and hypoventilation. These excesses can lead to carbon dioxide buildup. While diving in this kind of condition, you must be careful because any alteration in the pattern of your breathing, especially if it's a change in the rate of breathing, will alter the calculation of air you previously made. Both divers planned their descent to be 10 to 12 minutes, but for the sake of decompression and to be able to optimally manage gas, it's preferable to take a rapid descent. Jim had planned a descent rate of 100 feet per minute to 300 feet, then to 600 feet. However, when his descent got to around 750 to 800 feet, he planned on slowing down because this is the depth he had previously experienced high pressure nervous syndrome when diving in the Bushman's Hole of South Africa. Both Jim and Sheck were breathing from their air cylinders till they reached a depth of 290 feet. Upon reaching this depth, Sheck waited a moment to stage his air cylinder. He fixed the cylinder to the line at 290 feet. Jim, on the other hand, made use of a small pony cylinder as his back-mounted cylinder for his air supply. Both of them later switched to Trimix, 10.5% oxygen and 50% helium, and the rest was nitrogen. This Trimix is a travel mix used mainly for deep-depth dives because they were proceeding from a depth of 290 to 580 feet. Both of them had well-planned gas mixes for a safe dive. The dive was going according to plan, but as Jim crossed the 800-foot mark, he saw a light shining in front of him. He could see Sheck's light far away. In the meantime, Sheck continued into the distance, and he was going at a faster rate than before. Usually, this rate of descent is so fast that it could lead to high-pressure nervous syndrome. At 700 feet, his body couldn't take it anymore, and it started going into fits. His vision was obstructed by hundreds of small concentric circles with sparkling dots, and he started experiencing itching and stinging all over his body. This was high-pressure nervous syndrome, brought about by several rapid compressions. The extreme pressure of his descent has affected his brain function, and this caused his neural circuits to run wild. At 750 feet, Sheck stopped considering his options, which was abort the descent or continue further down. He decided to continue his descent, but at a slower rate. 
When the bottom of the cave bottomed out at around 860 feet, Shek's body started shaking uncontrollably, but he ignored it. But even without seeing clearly due to the high-pressure nervous syndrome effect, he noticed he was on a lunar landscape, which was covered with small rocks and nearly one foot of black sediment. He had gone deep into the water where no one had ever been. He couldn't stay down there for a long period because he would have to decompress for a longer time if he did, which would last for extra hours. So he inflated his buoyancy device and started rising. And when he was halfway there till he got to the surface, the syndrome subsided. Meanwhile, Jim was at 900 feet before he was shocked when he realized that he had used more air than he planned. Going at this rate, he would encounter a failure from his regulator, which would be a huge issue for him. So he inflated his buoyancy control device, which halted his descent at 920 feet, and switched from his main tank to his backup tank at 450 feet. Now, both of his air tanks were empty, so he had to make use of the stage air he left while he was on the descent. This is usually done by divers when descending, so they can use it while coming up to the water surface. However, something horrible happened to him. When he turned on his new air tank, the regulator broke off with force. He panicked. He managed to reattach the regulator, but his mind was not at rest because it was no longer secured. He had to open and close the valve with each breath. He had around 8 minutes of stops between 350 feet till he got to where the next stage bottle was. Then he switched to the staged air with a functioning regulator and breathed a sigh of relief. At 250 feet, Jim switched to another air tank. At this point, he noticed that something was wrong with Sheck. He saw that the line Sheck used for his descent and his stage bottles were unused. His heart sank, but he consoled himself with the fact that Sheck had gone far below and would resurface soon. While consoling himself, he also questioned why Sheck would dive so deep into such a dangerous sinkhole. So he began to dive upward for decompression, which would take up to nine hours. Kristovich, who was their support diver, was on the surface of the water watching the bubbles coming from the two divers. About 18 minutes into the dive, Kristovich discovered that it was the bubbles coming from Jim alone. She could see that Shek's bubbles had stopped. As a result of this, she exchanged glances with Jim's wife, Karen, and she dove to meet him at the 47-minute mark. She was relieved to see him, but was shocked when she saw Sheck's equipment still untouched. However, Mary Ellen, Sheck's wife, was watching from the cliff with no idea of the grave situation that had happened. Mary went to meet Jim's wife, Karen, and they assessed the situation. Then she took an extra stage bottle and dove to meet her husband. She met with Jim and Kristovich, and her fears were becoming a reality. She quickly wrote on a dive slate that she was diving to 250 feet in search of her husband's bubbles, thinking that a ledge could have obstructed them from seeing the bubbles. But sadly, there were no bubbles when she got there. Jim's wife had also worn her gear and caught up with Mary at 150 feet as she was coming back up. She was crying and her mask was messed up. But Jim took hold of her gauge and saw that it read 278 feet. He had to hold her down for decompression for more than 40 minutes. That period was a very sad and lonely period for them. Jim later learned that Sheck was lost when he got to the 60-foot stop. The remaining decompression period was a long and painful period for him. He never thought Sheck wouldn't make it out alive. At the age of 45, Sheck breathed his last breath during an adventure into one of the world's deepest sinkholes, the Zakaton sinkhole. This dive made Jim the first successful diver to break the 900-foot barrier on the self-contained scuba air. His record depth of 925 feet overshadowed Sheck's old 881-foot record. Jim returned to the surface with pain in his shoulder and was immediately treated with oxygen, corticosteroids, and hydration. On the 7th of April, 1994, Kristovich and other support divers who were at the surface during the dive all went back to the sinkhole to recover equipment from both guidelines. They discovered that Sheck's equipment was very heavy, together with the steel tanks. The recovery team decided to use a pulley from the surface to draw out that equipment. After two days, during the process of recovery, the body of Sheck came to the surface. 
When his body came to the surface, the lines were found tied around his arms together with the valve of the mounted bottles at his side. Though the back-mounted bottles, valves, mounting plate, and his buoyancy compensator were not wrapped up together, his mask and other diving equipment were in place, but his regulator wasn't in his mouth. His BC was intact, having gas in it, and his inflator was still working. The wrist-mounted dive computers showed a maximum depth of 904 feet, which means the travails that led to his death started nine minutes into the dive. When the gases in his cylinder were analyzed, it showed he had an accurate mix. When the autopsy was conducted, there was nothing that could be explained as the cause of the accident. This could have been a result of the effect of immediate decompression and the fact that it was the third day that they were trying to conduct the postmortem analysis. They had difficulties with confidently making a postmortem analysis of Sheck's body. One of the most important rules of cave diving is to make yourself aware of the present conditions of the cave diving site before embarking on your journey. Ignoring this could result in life-threatening situations, as we'll see in today's story. The incident in this story is one of the most disturbing cave stories we've covered. Manatee Springs history can be traced back 9,000 years. The original residents of Manatee Springs were the Timucuan Indians. The entire picnic area was once a Timucuan Indian village. The Timucuans chose this site because it was alongside the Suwannee River, providing them with a means of transportation and fresh water. The spring was named by William Bartram when he saw a manatee carcass on the shoreline of the spring. Manatees are large, wholly aquatic animals. They're marine mammals, mainly herbivores, and they're also called sea cows. There was an attack near Manatee Springs between 1835 and 1842 called the Seminole Wars, led by Major General Andrew Jackson. Many Seminole Indians were killed while the rest were forced to leave Florida. The area then became settled by farmers who harvested timber from the spring and cultivated their crops there. After the incident at Manatee Springs, the spring was sold to the state and in 1954, it became the first Florida State Park. Manatee Springs is one of Florida's first magnitude springs and the longest spring run flowing directly into the Suwannee River. Manatee Springs State Park is located in Florida about six miles away from Chiefland on State Road 320 off US 19. Manatee Springs State Park is a great place to have fun and enjoy yourself. It has a variety of activities to enjoy, ranging from bicycling to boating, camping, fishing, hiking, scuba diving, and wildlife viewing. The West Indian manatee, after which the spring was named, finds the spring a good habitat because of the reduction of aquatic plants in the Suwannee River as a result of tannic acid, which darkens the river. Since manatees are herbivores, they move to Manatee Springs where they can get food and rest after they've traveled 23 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. In addition to manatees, there are also large numbers of American black vultures who come to Manatee Springs during winter. These vultures are not aggressive and they're not afraid of humans at the park. The cave system of Manatee Springs doesn't belong to the most popular cave diving sites in Florida because of strong currents. It can make diving difficult and reduce visibility. However, Manatee Springs has the best conditions when other cave diving sites are at their worst. For example, when flooding of the Suwannee River occurs, the visibility in the Manatee Cave system actually improves. There are many sinkhole ponds in Manatee Springs. Unlike other cave systems, the main entrance of this cave system is not easily accessible because it's too restricted due to the high current. To enter this cave system, you need to go to the Catfish Hotel. This sinkhole provides a huge window into the side of the cave. From the Catfish Hotel, you need to turn right and follow the main guideline upstream. The deepest depths of this cave system are upstream of Catfish, which is around 90 feet. There are other openings along the way, Sue's Sink and the Friedman Sink. Divers always traverse between caves. That is, they enter one cave and come out through another cave. 
Years ago, cave divers usually made their way by following Catfish Hotel and passing out through Manatee Springs Fountain, main entrance, a daring traverse in the high flow. Recently, the tunnels near the main entrance started collapsing. This made the holes much smaller, and passing out through these holes became more dangerous. Diving experts warn divers not to go through such passages any longer. Also, in this particular incident, the heavy downpour in November 2019 made the running water much stronger than it used to be, and the traverse became more dangerous and unsafe to dive into. Therefore, nowadays, it's strongly recommended to not turn left from the Catfish Hotel because the very strong current makes it extremely difficult to get back. A blockage at the main entrance of the cave system makes it extremely dangerous to attempt reaching there. Certified cave divers have died while doing this. Zhou Min, a 28-year-old woman, went on a cave diving adventure at Manatee Springs. She was a Chinese native. Zhou, along with three others, left China for Florida on November 24, 2019, with the purpose of diving. The four cave divers grouped themselves into two teams. The first team was led by Wang Yuan, who was a cave diving instructor and had over 500 hours of cave diving experience. Alongside him on the first team was Chen Qian, who had about 100 hours of cave diving experience. Zhou and Fu Shaiyu were in the second team, who were both newly certified as cave divers with about 11 hours of cave diving experience. The teams were led by Wang, the cave diving instructor, who was the most experienced diver of the group. He dove in Manatee Springs many years ago. He had traversed from the Catfish Hotel to the Manatee Springs exit three times. Since he hadn't visited the site recently, he wasn't pre-informed about the current situation of Manatee Springs and other water bodies around it. Things had changed from what they used to be. The cave had become extremely dangerous, more so than it was in those years of his past visits. But unfortunately, they didn't make any inquiries about the present situation there. They went with the mindset of the past. You should always ask questions about the present situation of things in any cave you have not visited for a long time. Conditions may not be the same as what they used to be. So for your safety, make inquiries before embarking on your journey, or at least when you get to the cave site. The two teams' dive plan was to exit the cave system downstream into Manatee Springs. The first team, Wang and Chen, entered the Catfish Hotel using their rebreathers and dive propulsion vehicles, or scooters. They connected the main rope and pushed against the water current upstream beyond Friedman's sink where they would turn around to join the second team. The purpose of this dive was to check the conditions of the route ropes and the Friedman exit. They stated that the visibility was not good. It was maintained in a range of 9 to 15 feet. However, they concluded that there was no risk of exceeding their capabilities and decided to push forward. They finished at about 1,600 feet, and the push took 35 minutes. Then, after ensuring the Friedman exit's safety and the surrounding area's circumstances, they advanced to 1,700 feet before setting down the first EAN-32 stage. EAN-32 stands for Enriched Air Nitrox. It's used to reduce the chance of decompression symptoms. The second team, Zhou and Fu, entered the cave system through the Catfish Hotel after one hour using LP-95 back-mounted double cylinders. They dove for a short time on their own and met up with the first team about 500 feet from the exit. The two teams would then proceed by following the Manatee Springs exit downstream from their meeting point. Team 1 planned to dive for 140 minutes and maintain an oxygen partial pressure of 1.2. Team 2 planned to dive for 80 minutes and maintained a no decompressions diving range. When both teams met each other, they checked their air volume and decided to proceed with both teams according to the plan. After five minutes, they arrived at the end of the knot. Wang reported that he had been there three times, and each time the light and shadow of the exit can be seen at this point. However, due to poor visibility, the exit was entirely black. Since they weren't able to see the exit, they used a jump reel to connect to the main line. At that moment, the depth was about 50 feet, 
As they went up the slope for about six feet, the current increased significantly. Wang was pushed against a wall, and the current at the top was too strong for them to handle. He held onto a stone to maintain his position, but failed. The strong current tore through his mask and rebreather. After 10 seconds, he started to choke and wasn't able to locate his teammates. He looked up and saw some light shining from outside the cave and started to move along the rock wall in that direction. The powerful current of the water washed him immediately out of the cave. As he saw that no one else came out, Wang tried getting back into the cave to rescue others from the strong current. Then he saw light signals from the second team, Zhou and Fu, to indicate that they were calling for help. However, at the same time, Chen, first team, was stuck in a bigger main hole. Wang tried to pull him up against the current, but failed, and as soon as he let Chen go, he was pushed to shallow water. Wang saw that Fu was also thrown out of the cave by the strong current. Fu was disoriented, but conscious. As there were still two teammates trapped inside the cave, Wang didn't check Fu's condition, and he directly entered the cave. Wang saw that Chen had become unconscious and his body was drifting with the current, though his regulator was still in his mouth. He also saw that Zhou no longer had her regulator in her mouth. Chen's scooter and lighthead were firmly jammed in the rocks. According to Wang, he had to move Chen away first to be able to reach Zhou. Wang cut the scooter and lighthead so that he would be free and he was immediately thrown out of the cave. By now, Wang hoped that someone would have helped his teammates Fu and Chen outside the cave, so he returned to help Zhou. Unfortunately, he was not able to reach her because of the strong current. Zhou's right hand and head were stuck in the gap of a small hole. Unfortunately, she couldn't pass through this small hole. Wang clutched her hand and a tremendous torrent of water continued to come out. At this time, he realized that he lost Zhou and was also worried about Chen's condition, so he decided to return to the surface. They found Chen downstream, and he was very confused, but was able to breathe again. However, they were worried that he may have developed water in his lungs from prolonged aspiration. They took him ashore and immediately called the authorities and notified rescue services. Wang again tried to bring Zhou back to the surface after Chen got ashore, but the force of the incoming water at the entrance of the cave prevented him from doing so for 10 minutes. At that time, he wasn't able to enter the cave due to his conditions. They could only wait for rescue personnel. In the meantime, Fu hurried to the park duty station to get help. About 20 minutes later, an ambulance arrived to transport Chen to the hospital for treatment. He recovered after medical treatment. The rescue workers showed up after an hour. The cave rescue crew made three efforts to retrieve equipment that evening, but abandoned it due to an excessive water flow. The rescue and salvage operations continued throughout the next day, from 7 in the morning until around 4 in the afternoon. They were unable to get her body out of the cave because it had been hooked by the rocks. Therefore, they forcefully had to drag it and the rocks pulled apart. This became another opening within the cave. After authorization, Zhou's buoyancy bladder was punctured to reduce water from dragging the body. The body was taken to law enforcement on site after they brought it to the surface. After the incident, the main line was removed from the Manatee Springs to the Catfish Hotel. In addition, a warning sign was placed there so that divers would not be harmed. Entering through Catfish Hotel to exit Manatee Springs is discouraged. You are strongly advised to go through other routes. This was the first cave diving disaster marathon. Let us know what you think in the comments section. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.